1840, a college student shot a professor. Was the murderer ever found? And was justice ever served? We're going to look into the murder of Professor John Davis and try to discover what caused the rioting at Jefferson's University. I'm Rachel and I'm back with another true crime. So we're going to talk about school shootings and the or school massacres because last time was my first one in this series and it was Pontiac's Rebellion. That one technically was not a shooting but it was a school massacre. Today's that we're going to be talking about is the first school shooting that happened in America. Before the University of Virginia ever had a student walk through its halls, discover facts, digging through the books in the library, or sit under the teaching of the professors. The university was first a vision in the mind of Thomas Jefferson. He began to plan and dream of this college in 1800, and in a letter to Dr. Joseph Priestley, he relayed his wishes to establish a university in the central part of Virginia. Jefferson was elected president of the United States in 1801 and served two terms, but he never lost sight of his dream. In 1809, he left Washington and retired to his home in Monticello. His vision became reality as the cornerstone of the first building of the university was laid on October the 6th, 1817. In November of 1821, six pavilions that would serve as professors' residences and lecture halls, two hotels for dining, and 82 student dormitories were completed, with another four pavilions, four hotels, and additional dormitories to be finished the next summer. In 1822, all buildings except one were complete. Due to a lack of funds, Jefferson's Rotunda modeled after the Roman Pantheon was not yet complete. It was going to be used for public examinations, worship services, a library, and for other purposes. All buildings needed to be finished before the university could open. By 1825, the university was complete and it opened its doors on March 7, 1825. Only five professors, all foreigners, and a few dozen students were present the first day. But two American professors arrived a month later, and by the end of the first year, there were more than 100 students. Jefferson paid his professors more than most colleges paid their teachers at that time, with the exception of Harvard. In the early 19th century, Writing was a common practice in the United States among students who either didn't like the food, the rules, or the punishments given to them. The Butter Rebellion over rancid butter that took place at Harvard in 1766 was the first recorded Harvard student protest. William and Mary students rioted in 1802 after professors punished two fellow classmates for dueling. Old fish and overripe cabbage were the cause of Harvard's Rotten Cabbage Rebellion in 1807. That same year, Princeton students rioted after three classmates were suspended. Jefferson wanted his school to be different. To be run in such a way that the students would self-govern themselves. They were allowed to choose their own studies. Other universities of the day allowed only three choices of specialization, medicine, law, and religion. Under Jefferson's guidance, the University of Virginia became the first in the United States to allow specializations in such diverse fields as astronomy, architecture, botany, philosophy, and political science. But 
there were many things the students were not happy about. When they arrived on grounds, they had to turn in their money to the provost and then accept it back in the form of a weekly allowance. They were prohibited from drinking and smoking and gambling. And they had to be in bed by nine. The university was very demanding with the first classes of the day beginning at 5.30 in the morning. It had the longest semesters of any university. They broke off just for a week or so over Christmas and had virtually no summer holiday except on the day of the 4th of July. This was actually one of the legitimate complaints of the students. UVA was one of the first universities in America, if not the first, to introduce an exam system. The earliest students were the sons of plantation owners or wealthy merchants and were part of a culture of entitlement. Being at the University of Virginia was for them part of a status system, and they did not receive correction well. This led to poor behavior and eventually to rioting. The riots began with students wearing masks. One of the students threw a urine-filled bottle through a professor's window. Students and professors were smoked out of their dorms. A couple of professors who had been sitting together heard the commotion and one of the professors ripped one of the student's shirts. The student cursed and raised a brick up to throw at him. A couple days later, on October 3rd, 1825, in what he later described as a most painful event, Thomas Jefferson appeared before a gathering of students professors, and trustees at the University of Virginia inside the rotunda. Due to the violent behavior of the students, some of the faculty threatened to resign. The University of Virginia, Jefferson's obsession, open for less than a year, was in jeopardy. During the meeting, Jefferson was so overcome with emotion he could hardly speak. Witnessing Jefferson's grief brought conviction to 14 students who came forward and confessed to joining in the riots. Jefferson immediately stopped crying and became very angry. One of the young men who came forward was Wilson Miles Carey, who was the nephew of Thomas Jefferson's daughter by marriage, Martha Randolph Jefferson, known as Patsy. Carey had a drinking problem and he had already been removed from Hampton Sydney College. Wilson Carey is the student that had raised the breakup. He said he thought the professor would back away. At this point, I'm sure Jefferson must have felt betrayed. Carey was expelled from UVA. Until his death, Jefferson would host Sunday dinners at his Monticello home for faculty and students. Jefferson visited his university for the last time in early June 1826 and died at age 83 on July 4th. The father of the University of Virginia was buried at Monticello on July the 5th. Things went somewhat smoothly for the university for the next few years. One of the university's most famous students, Edgar Allan Poe, arrived in 1826. Poe decorated the walls of his tiny range room with highly ornate figures drawn in charcoal on the white plaster walls. Once, a classmate who had pulled his money with Poe to buy a copy of Lord Byron's poems stepped into Poe's room to find him drawing a life-size image of Byron on the ceiling taken from the frontispiece of the book. What a sight Poe's room must have been. While in attendance, he excelled in Latin. The Raven Society, an organization named after Poe's most famous poem, continues to maintain 13 West Range, the room Poe inhabited 
during the single semester he attended the university. He ended up having to leave after only one semester because of financial difficulties. In 1831, the faculty attempted to enforce a uniform for the students in order to create unity between rich and poor scholars and to discourage frivolous spending or displays of wealth. The university relied on public funds, so the Board of Visitors wanted to try and dispel illusions among the public that Jefferson's university was an elitist establishment. Despite this sound reasoning, there was significant resistance to the law among students, and it was eventually relaxed in 1834 and repealed entirely in 1842. Students frequently petitioned the faculty of the university to express concerns and grievances over rules they felt were unfair. One of Jefferson's visions was for students to receive military instruction at UVA, and with his approval, students formed a military company and began drilling on the university's grounds. In 1831, the faculty allowed students to manage the company independently because university regulations banned students from keeping or using weapons or arms of any kind the professors insisted that their students could only use muskets during military exercises. The students agreed and organized the university volunteers. At the beginning of each academic session, students asked for and received the faculty's permission to organize the company for another year. In 1836, however, students began parading and drilling without first acquiring faculty permission. By then, about 70 of the university's 265 students had joined the company. When the faculty noticed the students drilling, the faculty chairman, John A.G. Davis, reminded them of the terms of the 1832 agreement and announced that, quote, the faculty reserve the right of dissolving the corps whenever the interest of the university shall in their opinion require it." End quote. I want to break for a moment to talk about the chairman, John Anthony Gardner Davis. He was born on March 1802. He was the son of Stage Davis and Elizabeth Macon Davis. From 1819 to 1820, Davis studied at the College of William and Mary where the president called him likely to be the most distinguished man of his time in Virginia. In 1821, Davis married Mary Jane Terrell, who was a great niece of Thomas Jefferson. He was admitted to the bar in 1822 and opened a law practice in Middlesex County. The couple moved to Charlottesville in 1824 where they constructed a residence at Lewis Farm, which is now on the National Register of Historic Places, and where Davis continued to practice law. Believing that lawyers needed a broad education, Davis studied science during the first session of the University of Virginia in 1825. In 1830, he was elected the second professor of law at the university and became the first of several law professors to reside in Pavilion 10 on the lawn. Davis and his wife had seven children. All of their sons attended the University of Virginia. He was a wonderful professor to his students and was even known to bring six students into his home and nourish them with tender care. He always took time to listen to the students' troubles with a sympathetic ear and offer wise counsel. The Board of Visitors eventually abandoned Jefferson's vision of student self-government and gradually tightened regulations. Beginning in 1831, the Board required the faculty chairman, John A.G. Davis, to inform its members of every student offense. In 1832, the Board required students to inform against each other 
and prohibited students from assembling in the library. In 1834, it ordered professors to continue lecturing during the Christmas season in order to prevent students from going home for the holiday. These rules increased the students' discontentment. At a company meeting on November the 6th, 1836, Thomas Morris, a Baltimore native and captain of the university volunteers, read the faculty regulations. The volunteers insisted that the faculty had no right to dictate terms to them. And the following night, Davis recorded in his journal, several students set off six or eight very loud reports of musket fire in protest. In response, on November 9th, the faculty adopted a resolution requiring students to surrender their weapons. Davis opposed the measure, arguing that the volunteers' actions reflected students' ignorance of the laws rather than deliberate resistance to authority. He urged caution, fearing the faculty resolution would unite the student body and cause the whole company to oppose the faculty, forcing the dismissal of them all. The following evening, a student committee met with the faculty to present their own set of resolutions. They boldly proclaimed that the company is not disbanded and that it would continue drilling in defiance of the faculty. Each member of the company pledged his honor to stand by his comrades, announcing that action of the faculty against one shall affect every individual. While the company met with the faculty, the other university volunteers began shouting and firing their muskets on the lawn. Davis wrote, that the roar of musketry was so deafening that it interrupted their conversation. The faculty ordered the volunteers to disperse, but the students refused. The riot continued for another two hours until a heavy rain forced the students inside. Fault lines, however, began to emerge within the university volunteers. The company drafted its defiant resolutions on November the 10th. When a few students hesitated to pledge their honor to support the company, their classmates insulted them until they submitted. The following day, these moderate students pleaded with the others to rescind the resolutions, but to no avail. In this culture of Southern honor, the volunteers could not back down. Honor demanded action. And company leaders, according to Davis Journal, saw it as an honor to head a rebellion against faculty authority. Even the moderate students refused to accept disgrace or dishonor. On November 11th, several students went to Davis in tears. They told him that they recognized the impropriety of their resolutions but they were now honor-bound to support them. They had given their pledge and could not retract it. Davis acted cautiously, trying to avoid a larger confrontation. He planned to postpone the next faculty meeting to allow time for students and professors' tempers to cool. He still believed that nine-tenths of the volunteers were totally ignorant, not only of the law, but of the facts of the case. If he could only explain the situation rationally, he hoped students would back down. In reality, however, student unrest was growing stronger. The volunteers were actively recruiting and new members were joining their ranks. If Davis delayed any longer, he feared the company's ranks could swell from 70 to more than 100. Recognizing the need for action, Davis convened a faculty meeting on November 12th. The professors decided to deal with the students individually, calling each student in turn to account for his actions. When the faculty dispatched a janitor to summon the first student, however, Captain Thomas Morris replied that the entire company was busy drilling 
and could not leave. The professors then sent the proctor, Willis Woodley, to identify the disobedient students. When the proctor arrived on the lawn, Morris halted the volunteers and defiantly called roll, demonstrating that the entire company was present and still in possession of their muskets. The company then unanimously passed another resolution, quote, that they had their arms and intended to keep them, end quote. Returning to the faculty meeting, the proctor recorded the names of the students who were present at the drill, and the faculty voted unanimously to dismiss them from the university. The announcement ignited two days of rebellion on November 12th through 13th, what Davis described as a scene of great disorder and violence. The university volunteers took possession of the rotunda, climbing the dome and planting the company's flag in the skylight. As other students joined the rebellion, the rioters divided into two groups. One group remained at the rotunda, furiously ringing the bell, while the other group marched through nearby Charlottesville, destroying property. Students rioted until 2 a.m. and resumed four hours later. They shattered windows with rocks and musket fire, broke doors with sticks, and rang the rotunda bell throughout the day. Because Davis served as the faculty chairman, the volunteers blamed him for their dismissal and focused much of their violence on him. On the night of November 13th, Davis recorded in the chairman's journal that students made a violent attack on his home, Pavilion 10. Students threw stones, beat at his door, and shattered his window panes. They lit a bonfire on the lawn before dispersing for the night. The next day, two students warned Davis that far greater outrages would be committed by the dismissed students unless they were given consideration. Professors began arming themselves, preparing to defend their families against physical violence. To restore order, Davis wrote to the Albemarle County Deputy Sheriff and two justices of the peace asking for help. Armed soldiers arrived on November 15th and officials summoned a jury to begin investigating the violence. Their presence ended the rebellion. According to Davis in his journal, some students concealed themselves and many fled. By November the 19th, Davis reported that order and quiet had been completely restored. The night of November 19th, a large group of students held a meeting at the rotunda to draft another set of resolutions. The students expressed confidence in the integrity and sincerity of the university volunteers and asked the Board of Visitors to calmly and deliberately review the situation. They acknowledged their obligation to obey university regulations, and if the Board of Visitors ruled that the faculty had the authority to disband the volunteers, the students would accept the decision. In the meantime, the students vowed not to use their muskets. On November 22nd, the faculty met to discuss the rioters' fate. The parents of two of the volunteers urged the professors to readmit all the dismissed students with no distinctions between those who had participated in the riot and those who had not. Before the riot, each member of the company had pledged his honor to stand by his comrades and treat the action of the faculty against one as an attack on every individual. The students were still bound by these pledges. If the faculty only allowed students who had not taken part in the riot to re-enter the university, then no student could re-enter without being disgraced in the opinion of his fellow students. For Davis, however, the issue was more complicated. Throughout the crisis, he had blamed the volunteers' leaders for deceiving their classmates and pushing the company toward rebellion. He still believed that these leaders had taken advantage of the ignorance, youth, and weakness of their classmates to extort from them pledges which placed them at the mercy of those who had misled them. If the faculty only readmitted these good students, they were unlikely to cause trouble again. Davis believed that the ones who were actually guilty should be expelled from the university permanently. Ultimately, however, 
he supported readmitting all the dismissed students, recognizing that no students would choose to re-enter the institution otherwise. Having pledged their honor to stand together, students would probably find it easier to accept dismissal of all the students involved more acceptable than a policy that allowed some students to re-enter and not others. The faculty gave permission to all the dismissed students to re-enter the university as long as they could deny participation in the riot or make proper atonement for their participation. In the days ahead, at least 21 of the dismissed students applied for and were granted readmission. In August 1837, long after the crisis had subsided, the Board of Visitors reaffirmed that the faculty had control over student military organizations. The faculty could abolish these companies at any time and could dictate the terms of their existence. Going forward, the Board tried to extend control over student life by prohibiting students from bringing horses onto the university's grounds, banning student speeches, and limiting student access to alcohol. Despite these efforts, student misconduct would continue. In the years following, November 12th became a sort of holiday during which students rioted in commemoration of the dismissed students and in celebration of rebelling against the faculty. In 1837, students fired pistols and broke into the belfry to ring the bell while students in disguise danced in front of a Professor George Tucker's room and made a bonfire on the lawn. The next year, students again celebrated the riot, though in fewer numbers. By 1840, the rioting had almost completely ceased, but there were two students that didn't want to see it end. Hunter Marshall, a fourth-year student from Caroline County, Virginia, witnessed the events on the night of November 12, 1840, and gave his account in a letter to friend and fellow Virginia student, William Carrington. Through Marshall's letter, we get a very detailed retelling of one of the most infamous events in the university's history, but also a glimpse into the attitude of the student body. Marshall named William A. Kincaid and Joseph Green Sims as the two perpetrators of the riot, though at the time the students did not recognize the rioters. Quote, Kincaid was disguised in a suit of drab with his face black, while Sims was disguised by putting his shirt and drawers over his clothes and a calico mask on his face. End quote. The two students walked down the east lawn shouting and shooting pistols. The noise attracted a group of onlookers including Chairman Davis, who discouraged other students from going down to the rioters. Several students warned them that Professor John Davis had come out of his pavilion to identify and punish the revelers. Kincaid and Sims stated, quote, they cared not for Davis, end quote, and continued walking down the lawn to Charles Bonnie Castle's residence. At Bonnie Castle's, Kincaid stopped to fire his pistol and quickly disappeared down an alley that Sims kept walking. As Davis approached, he ordered Sims, or as the onlookers knew him, the figure in white, to stop his noise and disperse. But Sims responded with derisive laughter. When Davis attempted to remove Sims' mask, the young Georgian aimed his pistol and shot Davis in the stomach. Kincaid was still by Bonnie Castle's residence and had apparently not witnessed the event. He walked down to the commotion to ask another student what was the matter. To this, the student simply replied, somebody shot. After this, Kincaid reportedly went to wash his face paint off, dressed in his own clothes, and went to Colonel Ward's tavern to see the ladies. After fleeing the scene of the crime, Sims went to his room to remove his disguise and later returned pretending to be an innocent onlooker. Though. He had nerve strong enough to keep from betraying any emotion. A few students suspected him. However, they did not make known their suspicions. Marshall noticed how Sims gave, quote, attention to every word that was uttered concerning the probable effect of the shot, end quote. Kincaid also quickly fell under suspicion and a committee was formed to find him 
and determine his guilt or innocence. The committee eventually caught him, still at Ward's Tavern, and asked about his involvement in Davis' shooting. He admitted his involvement in the riot, but proclaimed his innocence in the shooting of Professor Davis, producing his drab coat as proof. The group knew the person who shot Davis was dressed in white. He refused, however, to give up the name of his accomplice. The next morning, two students carried Kincaid into the woods to prevent him from informing on his friend and to help him evade authorities. Meanwhile, another student named Pope suddenly remembered having loaned Sims his pistol and one ball, quote, that ball not perfectly round owing to a deficiency of lead when molded, end quote. Sims' behavior to Pope was especially suspicious. When Pope asked for his pistol back, Sims said he had let someone else have it, but refused to say whom. This was enough evidence for the students who sent for a magistrate to take Sims into custody. When the magistrate asked Sims to take an oath on the Bible, he refused, alleging that it was contrary to his principles. He was an atheist and didn't believe in the Bible. Despite this, the magistrate still asked Sims to take an affirmation and took Sims into custody. An examining court was held to determine the evidence against Sims. Professor Davis' nephew claimed to have witnessed the shooting, and another student claimed that the hat worn by the perpetrator was the same hat Sims had worn earlier. On Saturday, November the 14th, the whole scene was changed by Mr. Davis' death. The bullet that killed Davis was retrieved and proved to match the one in the pistol lent to Sims. This was the damning evidence, and Sims was put in strict custody. After this, students gathered in the rotunda. Each was made to prove his innocence in regard to Davis's death, and a punishment was given to those who had assisted Kincaid's escape. Kincaid was still at large, but was soon found hiding near the Midway Hotel. Some students followed him, apprehended him, and brought him before the examining court where he confirmed his side of the story, saying he saw the figure in white fight with Davis, but claimed he did not see the actual shooting. In the past, students had always defended their disobedient classmates against faculty authority, as they had during the riot of 1836. This time, however, Students sided with the faculty, acknowledging that the violence had gone too far. Students captured Sims and brought him to the Charlottesville jail, where he remained imprisoned for months awaiting trial. Marshall commented that Sims' spirits during this whole process were remarkably high for someone accused of murder. He says, quote, while in custody, he would laugh and joke was unmoved even when he heard of Davis' death. At least he had not show his emotions." End quote. After this initial examination, Sims' parents posted his bail. He was scheduled to go to trial in October 1841. Not surprisingly, when the trial date came, he never showed up in court. Rumors spread about his whereabouts for several years. Some students said they heard he moved to Texas. Others said he committed suicide. One rumor was correct, but it was not confirmed until 2013 by Jean L. Cooper, a UVA librarian who maintains a blog about 19th century UVA students. She tracked down a Baltimore newspaper from July of 1847 that reprinted an item from the Charlottesville Republican about Sims' death. He shot himself with a pistol, the ball entering the left eye and penetrating the brain. The Charlottesville paper said, describing his body slumped in a chair at his brother's house in Georgia. Quote, on the table was found an open note stating in the form of the certificate dated July 9, 1847, that his death was occasioned by himself. End quote. Tradition holds that Davis's death prompted students and administrators to create the university's honor system. The reality is more complex. Early in the 1840s, students continued to drink, party, beat slaves, sleep with prostitutes, and vandalize university property. 
Recognizing that the university's strict regulations did nothing to stop the disorder, the law professor Henry George Tucker proposed a return to Jefferson's original vision of student self-regulation. In 1841, three students were arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct at a local tavern. Rather than expel them, however, the faculty allowed them to remain at the university after signing a written pledge to abide by the university's rules. For each of the students, three co-signers promised to report any violations of the pledge. As the historian Jennings Wagner has written, quote, the integrity of their vow now made it honorable, not dishonorable, to report on the misbehavior of those who had pledged their word. In 1842, the faculty institutionalized this approach by creating an honor system to prohibit cheating on examinations. They later expanded the system to encompass lying and stealing. During these same years, the Board of Visitors also repealed or suspended several of the university's most despised regulations, including the Uniform Law and Early Rising Law, which controlled what students could wear and what time they had to wake up. Professors appealed to students' sense of honor, promising to enforce the rules fairly, but expecting students to obey them. University culture began to stabilize as the faculty redirected students' sense of honor toward maintaining order, rather than mocking it. Even so, tensions lingered, and in 1845, students rebelled once again, forcing the faculty to call in several hundred soldiers to restore order. The chaos of the 1836 riot repeated itself in 1845 and in countless smaller acts of discord and disorder throughout the University of Virginia's early history. Thank you for joining me for another true crime and I'm going to be working on another one, the next school shooting. I believe it's 1853. There's even more interesting things that I didn't include like the library at one point, the rotunda, it caught on fire and we actually have a picture. I'll show you the picture and this was interesting and so in the picture it looks like it's on fire but the man who took the picture didn't, he wasn't able to go, it wasn't like he could just pull out a phone so he went and grabbed his camera and all that by the time he got back the flames weren't there and so he etched them in and to make it look like the flames were still there and so I found that quite interesting and just some other things I didn't include in here and let me know in the comments if if there's ways I can improve or if there's things you want to know about or want me to do a deep dive on let me know I really do enjoy it it just takes me a couple weeks sometimes to be able to um, get it all put together and to be able to film and edit and everything but I am enjoying it. Hopefully as I get more established I can um, get the videos out more quickly and right now it's hard to find a place to film because this is my studio but around me is a lot of chaos which drives me crazy because we're redoing my daughter's room and so we have flooring from her room in here and so you have to be careful not to trip on that and just some different things in here that aren't usually in here but um tried filming outside i filmed my devotional outside and i just kept having to stop because the car is coming by so i just thought i would try in here and i was able to find a spot and just try not to pay attention to to the stuff around me because it can drive me crazy a little ocd sometimes so um but yeah, if there's any videos or anything you're interested in, um, true crime wise or devotionals, so just give me ideas of anything that you're interested in and I will try to read comments if you leave them. And if you wouldn't mind, just like and subscribe because it's simple, something you can do to help my channel grow and doesn't cost you anything or anything like that so all right i hope y'all have a wonderful day and a wonderful rest of the week and i will catch you next time all right bye bye